Starting off the early successes from the genre-defining titles Doom and Doom 2, id Software in the late 90s had their eyes set on taking their shooter roots into the next generation. Quake was just that for id Software, and then some. Boasting a stronger engine and a bigger multiplayer focus, Quake games dominated the late 90s and the early 2000s. As online shooters evolved throughout the 2000s and a decade later in 2010, this marked the last time we had seen a Quake game for nearly 8 years, and that Quake game, Quake Live, was an updated version of the 1999 shooter, Quake 3 Arena, meaning that the last realistically played Quake game was as of 2017, nearly 18 years ago. That was until id Software teamed up with publisher Bethesda to create a fusion of old-school shooter mechanics and the hero and ability shooters of the more modern age. That title will be named none other than Quake Champions. Quake Champions launched in early access in 2017, and despite having the advantage of being advertised by Bethesda itself at E3, yes, Quake is back. Yeah! And quite the hype behind the game, it has unfortunately been unable to maintain its initial levels of success in just two years of being in early access. As of the summer of 2019, population is continuing to shrink on Steam concerning Quake Champions. And when just a few months ago the lead designer on the project was quoted as saying that the game doesn't really need a whole lot of content updates to function, Quake Champions' future isn't looking too bright. On this episode of Death of a Game, we will try and diagnose the close-to-death multiplayer arena shooter Quake Champions, and why the game has failed to capture an audience and recapture its old. Don your fedoras and sharpen that intuition, fellow detectives, as we uncover the mystery surrounding one of the longest-standing multiplayer shooters seemingly losing its place in the market. The history of Quake games that came before Quake Champions is quite important, and relevant for diagnosing the struggling shooter. That's why we're going to start back at the beginning of it all. The story of Quake Champions stretches quite far into the past, as the Quake name itself is one of quite the legacy, launching a plethora of shooters under the IP over the past 20 plus years. It's Software, the company behind Doom, and then subsequently the Quake franchise, which spawned as a successor to Doom, was founded by Adrian Carmack, John Carmack, Tom Hall, and John Romero in Texas. Following the successes of Doom 1 and 2, id Software wanted to utilize their new tech and make a successor to the Doom IP of sorts, Quake. Quake had an updated 3D rendering able engine, and they took Doom's mostly quiet multiplayer success and personified it with just about each iteration subsequently. When id Software followed up Quake 1's success with a sequel, well, not exactly a sequel, Quake 2 wasn't a sequel, it was originally meant to be a completely different game. With Quake 2's launch in 1997, id Software continued to iterate on the multiplayer functionality of the franchise and upgraded graphics. Now it's relevant to follow these early Quake game launches because they are so relevant to the mystery of Quake Champions, especially the next Quake game to launch in the series, which would establish itself as one of the most popular online shooters of all time. Welcome to Quake 3 Arena. Quake 3 Arena, as it was dubbed, launched as the third Quake game in the series in December of 1999, this time as a multiplayer-only shooter shedding its single-player campaign for the first time. Quake 3 Arena is when the trademark Quake feel was really perfected for many fans of the franchise. With crisp movement and that classic arena shooter feel, and with more advanced movement options, such as rocket jumping and strafe jumping, movement was always fast and rewarded those who had the skill required to time and space jumps properly. Quake 3's long reign on both the online and land space was littered with many different professional esport competitions erected either just for Quake 3 or just featured Quake 3 added, such as the World Cyber Games, Dreamhack, Cal, and of course QuakeCon. The Quake IP then had Quake 4 launch in 2005, and though most people try and forget that title, as it was developed in conjunction with Raven Software and id Software, though primarily development came from that of Raven, the outside company, Quake 4 had an obvious focus on the single-player side of things, almost as if they were trying to make a compliment to Quake 3's lack of. But as former id Software employee and the original Quake director John Romero explained of Quake 4, Quake 4 is where the brand went off the rails. Doom and Quake were mashed up together. Looking at Quake 4, you can't tell if you're in a Doom game or a Quake game. There was biomechanical stuff that belonged in Doom. It was dark like Doom 3. It didn't feel like Quake. Doom and Quake would always be linked as projects, but the desire to make Quake 4 like Doom certainly didn't delight many fans of the mostly multiplayer-focused title. Humiliation. 
Its software would also do another Quake game and name in enemy territory Quake Wars in 2007, and then an updated version of Quake 3 Arena, Quake Live launched in August of 2010. Quake Live picked up right where the 1999 project Quake 3 Arena left off, with a new interface, the ability to be played through the internet browser as a browser game, and updated multiplayer functionality. Quake fans were mostly delighted with the launch, especially after Quake 4, even if it was just Quake 3 again. Now, Quake Live as a service and game picked up right where Quake 3 left off competitively as well, and led to many more great moments and matches, including this one. To Hang doing exactly what he did before. Oh. Just around the corner, here we go. Rocket drop down from the Hang. Rafa's going to be chased down and get picked off. To Hang escape 71 points of health. And of course, many great players like these. And as shown in the clip before, To Hang and of course, Rafa. Get it. Oh, oh, Rafa. Yeah. Yeah. What a round yeah, for play. Rafa. Quake Live would also launch on Steam and change its business models by 2015, and yet there hadn't been a new Quake game in 8 years at that point. And throughout this time period, games like Call of Duty, Halo, Team Fortress 2, and Counter-Strike had been dominating the shooter audiences. The name Quake as of 2015 simply didn't have the same weight behind the IP, especially with the last bastion of sorts, Quake Live suffering its own loss of players over time. I believe there are two major occurrences that led to what id Software decided to do with their next Quake IP that was sort of at the time just sitting on the shelf. Oddly enough, both of these things occurred in the same month. Firstly, id Software brought back the Doom IP for their 2016 adaptation of the game published by Bethesda Softworks. Doom boasted the powerful id Tech 6 engine with snap maps which allowed for custom mapping and custom mods, and much more and surprisingly comprehensive attempt at a multiplayer game as well as a very comprehensive single player game. Doom sold over 2 million copies, being a resounding success for a reboot of the Doom series. This had a ripple effect for Quake as an IP. As the studio director of id Software Tim Willett said, when the team was working on 2016 Doom, we saw how successful that was going to be by bringing back that Doom DNA. We felt that Quake could use the same infusion. This most certainly meant a new Quake game was in the works, but what also happened in May of 2016 certainly affected the future of this new Quake title. Industry titan Blizzard Entertainment launched Hero Shooter Overwatch on May 24th, 2016. The game went on to great success, smashing many records and doing quite well commercially. Overwatch, like with World of Warcraft in a sense, Blizzard had been able to capture yet another powerful project that other companies were wanting to copy the success from. WoW clones or Overwatch clones started sprouting up left and right, many of which didn't fare so well. But just like with World of Warcraft, Blizzard had yet again turned an idea guided by another titan of a shooter in TF2 as inspiration, like WoW did with EverQuest, and dominated yet another genre for a time. Why does this pertain to the next Quake title exactly? Well, that much was announced just one month later, in June of 2016 at E3 with an announcement trailer to boot. Quake Champions was announced at E3. As the announcement stated with most shockingly, however, was the inclusion of particular characters with their own unique abilities. Kind of like a class or a hero shooter, like Overwatch or TF2 perhaps? To those who'd never played the Quake games during the height of their popularity, you might not understand the offense here. But even looking at the amount of dislikes on the video, you can see that Quake fans weren't exactly happy that their title's newest game was going to be based on the class slash hero shooter model. Quake was a game about precision and movement. Everyone was on equal footing upon spawning, but you could change this however by traversing the map and finding power-ups that would grant you either armor or shield. There were also unique weapons spread around the map, such as the ultra-precise and deadly railgun, the bombastic and splash-damaging weapon the rocket launcher, and of course the tracing-centric lightning weapon, the lightning gun. When you start to tamper with things such as the game's very successful map design, character stats and movement, and introduce more variables such as different HP and abilities for different characters, the audience who enjoys Quake for what Quake was are going to be more on the hardcore side of things in terms of shooter fans. It was infuriating for many of these Quake purists, and I can see that perspective. I also think it's worth mentioning that perhaps the Quake model did need to evolve, but that will be apparent as we continue in our journey. More red flags for some came out concerning Quake Champions pre-launch. It turns out that Quake Champions wouldn't be utilizing the id Tech 6 engine that Doom 2016 did. This is when it came out that Quake Champions wouldn't just be an id Software project. They would be working in conjunction with the Russian branch of the game developer Saber Interactive. Saber Interactive had experience working with ports and smaller titles in the past, but as studio director Tim Willett said to PC Games in, 
It was also a decision of pure practicality. We've been working on this, Quake Champions, longer than id Tech 6 has been finished. But we feel for the audience we're going for, and what we want to accomplish, this was the best path forward. This seemed awfully familiar to their situation with Quake 4, and we remember how that went. As the article postulated, despite id Software's massive success with Doom, they were deciding to outsource with Quake Champions to Saber Interactive for stated pure practicality. Hopefully that would mean that Quake Champions was still getting the full support and effort from id Software and their publisher Bethesda. Bethesda doesn't come into play too much in the story of Quake Champions, as far as we can tell in the public sphere. Perhaps there was some string pulling behind the scenes as expected, but Bethesda I would wager didn't have as much to blame about the failures of Quake Champions according to Tim Willits, who himself stated that both him and the id Software team, as well as Saber Interactive, were in agreement about introducing characters and abilities into Quake. I mean, he said the pro players at QuakeCon were enjoying it, so clearly that means that things are shaping up, right? Hmm. The problem with Quake Champions not using the id Tech 6 engine was that the game wouldn't have support for snap maps, mod support, or other upgraded features in Doom 2016's multiplayer. A Quake game without customization, customization the fans of the IP had been used to for over 15 years, probably not the best idea out of the gate. But perhaps they really did have no other choice in using the amalgamation of an engine that they ended up using. Sensing the criticism of their newly announced Quake title and its use of champions or heroes, Tim Willits came out stating that Quake Champions was not a MOBA. Uh, I don't think anybody thought it was. They are, however, wondering why TF2 and Overwatch are leaking into their Quake soda. Willits even made it a point to dispute the claim that itself stating that something to the effect of Quake Champions wasn't inspired by Overwatch, and that champions are merely a natural evolution of Quake in the genre, and they don't change fundamental gameplay. Except, T's wrong. They do. Otherwise, there wouldn't be an entire game design built around the concept of heroes and their specific abilities. To imply that abilities that can net you kills or keep you from dying in a fight wouldn't be significant enough to change the fundamental gameplay, that just confuses me out of the gate. What was Quake Champions trying to be? Did it want to take the Quake IP and modernize it to attract both some of the new and old fans? Wouldn't trying to appeal to two polar opposite in some case audiences, however, serve as a bit problematic for Quake Champions? Every step id Software and Saber Interactive took away from being a Quake game and learning bits from other shooters was a step they took away from their original core audience. I'm going to say something slightly controversial. Perhaps that's okay. Just like with a musician, developers aren't forced to keep making the same old same old game just because we want them to. They can innovate and certainly try new things. It's important to keep old franchises new and fresh and, most importantly, relevant. The problem is the original Quake audience like the original Quake experience, and so any deviation from that norm is going to be alarming and potentially off-putting to them. You have to balance that with the newer fans getting wind of Quake Champions and its champions with unique abilities, something they can more so relate to than the arena shooter aspects that are kind of older than them. The only problem is you have to look at those other Quake parts of the game. The game is difficult, and movement itself is enough to keep most players from truly mastering the game. Could id Software and Saber Interactive walk that fine line needed to both keep hardcore veteran fans engaged and newer fans interested alike? As the article which sums up Tim Willits' interview on YouTube states, Quake Champions was aiming to be everything the competitive Quake community wanted, and then some. Closed beta signups were announced for Quake Champions in the spring of 2017. P.S. This is where I enter the story. Closed beta would continue on later until that same year, in the fall, when Quake Champions launched on Early Access for $30 on Steam platform, August 22nd, 2017. Being launched in Early Access meant that many features expected from a typical Quake title were absent. Quake Champions also was not really properly reviewed due to the Early Access, but certainly did have some outlets saying some positive, and some negative things about the fledging new hybrid shooter of sorts. PC Gamer made it a point to highlight the annoying cosmetics and accompanying business model that came with Quake Champions. The skins didn't feel analogous to Quake at all, and seemed to just be thrown in to match with current market standards. Quake Champions also had XP boosts, loot crates, and you had to purchase champions unless you bought the champion pack. But even with the, as writer even Laddie from PC Gamer put in his closed beta impressions, microtransaction bullshit, Quake Champions was still one of the better arena FPSs we've had in the last decade. It, it still fundamentally resembles Quake. It, it, it walks and talks like Quake. It maybe doesn't sound like Quake, but it, it's still, for me, about 
Quake movement and Quake maps with Quake weapons. That's all there. But is that saying a whole lot when there hasn't been a whole lot of AAA attempts at an arena shooter? So even if titles like Reflex are positively received, the numbers weren't adding up yet. Can arena shooters still shake it in the world of gaming? Such would remain to be seen, but there was at least some semblance of a Quake game with Quake Champions. Perhaps something capable of being iterated on a bit and possibly smoothed out before their official launch. The population of Quake Champions and overall reception wasn't really noticed until basically the next year, in June 2018, where a big update for the title brought in bots finally, added an auto queue system, and a bunch of other changes the title desperately needed since it was still an early access title. Though getting rid of the multi queue was just about universally hated by the community. It's at this time on the Steam charts we can see that the game had the best population injection seen yet on the Steam platform. Peaking at over 17,000 players and 5,330 concurrent, the recent patch, marketing pushed by Bethesda, and id Software and Saber Interactive in the form of a free-to-play week or two seem to be doing the title quite well. On Steam, Quake Champions was boasting an overall rating of 69%, coming in just barely below a positive rating. The primary complaints from the game stemmed from performance issues, server issues, and matchmaking lacking certain modes or features. And finally, many players were wondering when the game would shed its early access title. But to shed its early access title meant it probably needed to be closer to launch ready, and it wasn't that yet. Just one month later, the population had dropped 54%, and by the end of 2018, despite a few new champions and a minor update here and there, Quake Champions was already dipping dangerously close to sub-1000 concurrent players, with peak players dropping to under 3500 players. These population numbers were regardless of Quake Champions changing its business models in the fall of 2018, when they made Quake Champions a free-to-play title. The population only jumped up 15% of its current players before dropping back down. Already in just one year of being live, Quake Champions was seemingly slowly bleeding out and there didn't seem to be anything the developers could do about it. By the end of 2018, Quake Champions was still in early access and still lacking many of the features featured in Quake Live. With so many gashes to tend to and no idea which gash specifically was bleeding so many players put id Software and Saber in a bit of a pinch. When they tried to constantly pump out new content, whether to monetize it in the form of skins and such, or new champions, players continued to echo that they preferred if the developers focused on fixing the performance issues rampant since the early access launch. Performance issues, by the way, echoed on just about every platform that people talk about Quick Champions on, and every single patch released on the Steam platform. But it's not easy to plug existing holes when you already have a massive hole in the first place. Launching as an early access title was already telling. It told many fans that Quick Champions wasn't ready yet. But how can you get your game ready post-launch when it is already so far behind in certain aspects? Aspects that fans were already used to with the IP. The December 2018 update came with a new map, Citadel. Inspired by the Stonekeep Capture the Flag map, and fitting for the map, was the revealing of the Capture the Flag mode for Quake Champions, finally, like with most Quake Champions updates that came with content, however, came with other aspects that weren't so enjoyable. Every time the game tried to fix itself, it continued to dig a deeper and deeper hole. With the December 2018 update also came a premium battle pass, much like Fortnite's quite popular battle pass system used as a primary source of revenue generation for Epic Games. With the coming of the battle pass system meant that you would no longer be allowed to purchase the champion packs. The patch was also supposed to fix many of these aforementioned bugs and performance issues, except as you can tell just by reading the comments on the update itself, they were unsuccessful in that. In fact, for many players, performance got worse after the December 2018 update, and with every bit of good that Quake Champions could muster, it was always seen as a, well, we kind of already expected that in Quake, and thus each good thing that the game implemented was sort of just treated as such, lackluster. Their mistakes, however, would compound, and they would continue to lose more and more players as it was becoming apparent that they couldn't fix many of the people's critical issues with the game, the game design notwithstanding. While this is a bit of speculation on myself in part, it's quite easy to see that its software, who had previously had their name all over Quake Champions, was having less and less involvement with the project. With the majority of the It Software teams working on mega projects such as Rage 2 and Doom Eternal, both titles set to launch later in 2019, well, perhaps Quake Champions had been primarily offloaded to their outside co-developer, Saber Interactive. And Saber Interactive wasn't exactly a one-game studio themselves either. Was Quake Champions getting the full attention and focus it so desperately needed? 
In a series of performance updates in January and February of 2019, its software was aiming at tackling these dreaded issues before they became more and more of a problem. Both of these updates, as you can yet again tell just from a couple of seconds of reading the comments, well, these performance updates were seemingly causing more issues than they were fixing. Was the core engine that Quake Champions built on simply just compromised? To accompany the new Battle Pass system in Quake Champions came a new XP scoring system, which many people speculated was a way of yet again controlling the rate of progression in Quake Champions, therefore affecting the way that you spend money in the game. This brings me to one of my biggest bits of evidence in diagnosing Quake Champions' grievous wounds. This is actually a quite general point that can frankly apply to many other games released post-2015. There has been this overwhelming shift by developers and publishers towards crowdfunding and early access Steam launches. These allow developers to get funding in ways they perhaps never would have been able to before. Fund their games and develop it in sort of a weird conjunction. The problem with this craze, which started as a way for developers to avoid the sphere of influence created by investors and publishers, was that big companies and publishers also started to rely on these methods of releasing games, seemingly because they, well, could. Big companies like Bethesda, frankly, are one of the particularly worst offenders. Pushing projects like Fallout 76 and Quake Champions to early access, in my honest fedora-wearing detective opinion, should never be allowed by the market. We should be shouting from the rooftops until everybody collectively is echoing that it's not okay for big giant corporations with ass loads of money to launch existing IPs as half-made, half-baked titles and expect our full profit. Bethesda with Quake Champions and Fallout 76, frankly, is another key example of a giant publisher taking a funding route that, frankly speaking, we shouldn't even allow, and then being flabbergasted when it doesn't go according to plan. Wow, it's almost as if launching your game unfinished and then trying to monetize it is almost working backwards. Hello? You have to prepare for success, especially when you can afford it. You can't launch your game with bare bones and expect it to then bring success after you start monetizing it. Can it work? Possibly. But are exceptions to the rule enough to provide that such a model works? Maybe in maximizing profits, but too many games have died on this very series by taking this exact approach I just outlined. Because it's almost like it doesn't work. You can't turn in a subpar product and hope people stick around long enough for you to fix the damn thing. Or at least you can, if you don't want it to work out the majority of the time. It's like starting a race to the finish, except you started 20 steps behind everybody else. And all throughout the time you are progressing through the race, you have to take a couple of steps back here and now and then to account for the blunders that you make in design or updates or whatever else and the natural burn of players. Will Quick Champions even make it to the end of this proverbial race? I mean it's 2019 and the game still hasn't launched out of its early access. Despite all of this, however, you can't blame the situation on the devs completely behind Quake Champions, since we don't know if they were just making the best of a bad situation. They were consistently putting up fixes, it's just that the fixes weren't really fixing anything. The Quake Champions Competitive Season 2 came in March of 2019, but with 738 concurrent players, is this push towards esports a little bit tone deaf? I guess custom games were finally unlocked for all players, including those who didn't purchase the Champion Pack. Quake Champions hadn't been doing very well for a while, and yet it and crew had kept pouring resources into the esports portion of Quake Champions because that was a strong basis for what they built the game for. Caught between being a hyper-competitive game turned modern shooter and a hope to attract a larger audience, that audience wasn't coming however, and the hardcore aspects of Quake Champions still made it a daunting try, even after going free to play. Where the mystery gets interesting, or even more interesting, is what just happened one month later. Saber Interactive, the developer co-penned to help its software work on Quake Champions in April of 2019, launched a big game of their own, World War Z. World War Z wasn't a smash success or anything, but after its launch, it was a bit interesting of a clue to come out of the whole ordeal. As rumored on a Russian site, Saber Interactive's Russian branch, who had been working primarily on Quake Champions, was reported as ceasing participation in the development of Quake Champions, and apparently that had been going on since back in October 2018. As the article also stated in the December 2018 patch, many players faced a significant drop in productivity, which apparently was entirely on the conscience of the employees from id Software and Bethesda. Rumors might just be that, rumors. But where there's smoke, sometimes there's fire, and updates were coming fewer and far in between for Quake Champions. The game seemed to have less people working on it than before, which is to be expected with such a small audience left playing the game. 
When Quake Champions did another level progression reset for people in March of 2019, it was the final straw for many people. Not even bringing custom games to free players or more performance upgrades could bring back the existing audience or attract a new one. As of the end of May 2019, Quake fan sites were asking the question on many of our minds here today. Was Quake Champions dying? Well, as the fan site Quake fans explained, things were well starting to look that way. Website author Smango seemed quite convinced that Quake Champions isn't on the up and up, and well, his evidence for that comes straight from the horse's mouth. Sink Error, or Adam Pyle as his real life tag states, is the lead designer working on Quake Champions, and for some reason he thought it was a good thing to say that out loud. Yeah, probably shouldn't have admitted that one, because content was surely needed in Quake Champions' case, and that's inarguable, since it's always stated as a primary reason that people have quit the game. And well, frankly, it's an easily verifiable thing. Firstly, Quick Champions had less maps, less modes, and by effect less features than its predecessor shooter Quake Live, which remember guys, is basically a 20 year old game. Now sure, over time Quick Champions started releasing champions at least one or two every couple of months, but Quake Champions was data mined back in 2017, and those champions already existed as ideas and characters before then. So were they just releasing unfinished champions? And it took Quake Champions nearly two years to get two versus two team deathmatch and capture the flag modes, which I would argue are some pretty critical game modes in Quake. Because Quake Champions was using the EdTech SaberTech engine of sorts instead of the EdTech 6 engine, they wouldn't get access to the great custom map features and custom lobby features that Doom's multiplayer got. What a strange scenario, the original game Doom having a better, more updated multiplayer than the game that came out later and was supposed to be designed originally to be the more technologically advanced version. It's almost like the rules reversed. But flashy graphics and nice sound effects aren't the only thing that people notice, especially with Quake purists, or just online shooter fans in general. Just like with those who put thousands of hours into classic shooters such as Enemy Territories, Team Fortress 2, and Counter-Strike, you need to allow players to have enough variety to stay interested in the game. Quake Champions having no custom mod or map support meant that it was always going to have less content than its predecessor titles. It was essentially a hole I'm not convinced they can ever fill with Quake Champions. Unless they port the game to a completely newer engine, and the likeliness of that with the current population, not likely. Almost as if Quake Champions fans collectively heard Adam Pyle's message, or just grew tired of playing a game that was still unfinished in the eyes of many, the summer of 2019 hasn't been exactly kind to Quake Champions so far. With the concurrent numbers dropping below 650 players, and peak players at 1,274, good luck finding a properly balanced match. In fact, I played some Quake Champions while writing this script and would have lobbies where nobody bunny hopped, and then get a lobby where everybody's basically ray gun quad camping. It's jolting to say the least. And that's the ultimate blow that usually fells any online game. A lack of player population to sustain the very game itself leads to the death of a game. Every time Quick Champions took a drop in players, it's felt that much more as an already niche game will struggle yet again to reach a more mainstream audience. If new players didn't want to play Quick Champions when it was populated, they sure as hell aren't going to want to do it whenever there's nobody left playing the game except just the hardcore player base. When matchmaking fails as it always does when population dies down, well, we have yet more wounds than the already severely injured Quake Champions. The June 2019 patch might have been seen for some as a last ditch effort of sorts for Quake Champions, and when that patch by the way, which was 20 gigabytes, did come, it added no new champions and no new maps. And as you could imagine, people weren't exactly very happy with it. Since that update, the population has dropped 10%. And as our friendly Steam comments suggest, perhaps, uh... <laughs> Before we pop open my journal and go over the clues concerning the death of Quake Champions, I wanted to make it a point to say that when I chose to do a video on Quake Champions, it was certainly a more personal project to me. I had played the game in closed beta, and although I missed most of the Quake craze growing up being a dirty Halo player, I was eager to soak up many of that Quake juice that everybody was so crazy about. And after realizing apparently Bethesda Launcher doesn't really work anymore, at least not for launching Quake Champions, I had to download the game on Steam, and upon first boot this is what I was greeted with. And then on the second, and third, and fourth, and until I uninstalled the game, the game refused to run for me, which certainly put a damper in my sales tremendously in my desire to play the game. I braved through it eventually and re-downloaded the game, which actually ran this time. Hooray! When I finally did get the chance to play Quick Champions again, the game reminded me exactly of the same reason that I enjoyed it the first time, as well as disliked it. 
I can't deny that the booming soundtrack and fast-paced gameplay certainly started to tug at my heartstrings a bit as I played some pug games of Quake Champions, but I was yet again reminded about the amount of randomness present in Quake Champions. Quake, as I put at the beginning of the game, was about being perfect to the multiplayer arena shooter experience as possible. At least that's what Quake 3 was, and it was the closest step towards that perfection. And so Quake Live just kind of capitalized on that success to a certain extent. Quake Champions attempted to do the same, but with so many new variables introduced into the game, the original Quake feel wasn't there anymore. And that was enough to send the Quake purist fans away, who the game was oddly enough kind of made for in a way. Actually, who was the game made for exactly? We have seen numerous quotes where id Software is clearly in support of esports and their competitive hardcore audience in Quake Champions. But yet everyone was in an agreement that Champions would interfere with that, and shit, even Tim Willits, that studio director guy that we mentioned earlier, stated that keeping that DNA, that essence of what Quake is, was always very important to us. This is certainly admirable, but when you also within a few quotes then fire out there's no active ability that's game-changing, and there's no superpower... Wait, oops, wrong, <laughs> wrong clip. Yeah, each new ability you bring in calls that original Quake essence, if you will, into question. And the auto turrets as an ability, well, I don't think I need to say anything about that to make my point. Eisen's sentry turret active ability allows him to deploy a single automated destructible turret. If we blow it up with the pro players, then we're not going to get any casual players. Hmm, wait, 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 what? So this entire time their plan has been to create Quake Champions to be this kick-ass eSport game, and that by other people watching people be awesome at the game, they would be inspired to play the game, sort of like in Dota or in League of Legends, and yet fails to offer the same kind of experience that the casual fans can enjoy in those games for a long time to come. They do realize that even with a successful competitive community, your game can fail, right? It's not like there hasn't been other cool eSport games that fail despite having cool eSport scenes, right? Going in with the idea that because your game has a high enough skill ceiling to attract pro players, it then means that they would be able to have fun watching the eSport or be a fun to watch eSport and attract a new audience of players to the title. That's an awful lot to ask of people, especially when you are essentially creating your own game in this way to appeal to two polar opposite audiences. And as the Quake team continued to ask pro players about their opinions about the game, Pro players just nodded in delight and said, sure, we'd love more chances to make money playing this game. I mean, I'm pretty sure they're going to be a lot more willing to say that, yeah, we're okay with that, we're okay with that, as long as you have big tournaments and we can still make some money. I think that with Quake Champions, id Software and Saber simply needed to take a stand. Was the game leaning towards more being hardcore, and were they comfortable with it having a more niche audience, or were they going to take it to some more significant steps to make the game more casually friendly? Well, so far as of 2019, they've done neither. They continue to take small steps in both directions, not committing fully to what they want to focus on. And I think that's an obvious flaw to Quake Champions, and a large reason it struggles to find footing. It's everyone's favorite part of a mystery, the point of deduction, where we combine all of our previous clues and evidence and attempt to put to bed the mystery surrounding why Quake Champions hasn't done so well. Launching an early access and not enough regular updates at this point in 2019 is one of the easiest first clues of a failing game. A Quake game in some ways, and yet not in others. Quake Champions had a crisis of identity, stuck between appealing to two polar opposite crowds and failing to do such to both. Rampant performance issues since inception and an inferior engine to boot severely hurt Quake Champions. Was Quake Champions an id Software project, or Saber, or both? Perhaps the title experienced more development hell than let on. Loot boxes, XP potions, and the typical standard fare microtransactions that we're all tired of, and not really convinced that they were necessary in the first place. While Quake Champions isn't literally dead yet, I feel confident in saying unless the things change drastically, their path is towards one of destruction. And yet there is still one mystery remaining, a question many will ask themselves after watching this or my Lawbreakers video. Perhaps it is time to answer the question of, are arena shooters a thing of the past? I can see some of the comments now, and yeah, some people don't consider Halo a arena shooter. It's hard to necessarily disagree though that arena shooters aren't exactly popular at the moment. I can't speak for the market as a whole, but in Quake Champions case, is Quake Champions defeat really a story of arena shooters failing or just Quake Champions failing? It's hard to say exactly as having champions with abilities isn't exactly very arena shooter in the first place. Perhaps that sort of model was not meant to be adapted to that of a hero or class shooter. And perhaps the other reasons we outlined greatly outshine simply being an arena shooter as well. 
Or maybe that age of gamer has sort of come and gone. If you still have that itch, however, fear not. You can still play Quick Champions for yourself for free and try out some of the free hero rotations. Splitgate also came out just back in April of 2019 and is a multiplayer arena shooter that combines shooter elements with portal-like elements. It might not tickle your fancy completely, but hey, if you're looking for a new arena shooter to play, it's one of the few new games of such. Thanks for watching, guys.